This is a 40 inch ultra wide with Thunderbolt 4 connectivity, making it absolutely ideal for productivity. Today we're looking at the Philips 40B1U6903CH, which sports a curved IPS panel that runs up to 75 Hz at 5120 times 2160. Indeed, that is a lot of pixels and it's coined by the manufacturer as 5K 2K. It also features adaptive sync technologies, HDR, a pop-up webcam, and also a built-in KVM switch. Now at the time of filming and in the UK, it can be found for roughly 1,500 pounds. Now in this video, which has been sponsored by Philips Monitors, I'll be covering everything you need to know about it so that you can make your own informed purchasing decision. So to kick off, I would like to talk about its inputs. And if you want to output the native resolution at the maximum refresh rate, you want to be connected over a DisplayPort 1.4 or indeed Thunderbolt 4. And here I was able to output the native resolution at the maximum refresh rate at up to 10 bit. Although it's worth noting over here, the monitor is rated at 8 bit plus FRC. Now you have also got two HDMI 2.0 ports, but due to the bandwidth capabilities, this will limit you at up to 50 Hertz. So past the resolution and refresh rate, I would like to point out that the Thunderbolt 4 port is among one of the first that I have seen on a monitor, specifically given the fact that it has also USB 4 compliance. Now this means that it has got 40 gigabits per second data transfer speeds, multi-stream support for daisy chaining, up to 90 watts of power delivery, and also delivers one gigabit ethernet speeds. Indeed, this is all achieved via a singular cable. Now, if you do want to hook up two of these monitors side by side, you'll want to utilize the multi-stream transport, and this can be achieved via the secondary USB Type-C port. This also achieves up to 15 watts of power. Now, past that, you have got the RJ45 port, which will be handy for connecting up to the internet, and then you've got a USB Type-B input. This gives you access to the two USB Type-A ports, which are found underneath the monitor, and the two USB Type-A ports, which are found towards the side of the monitor, one of which also supports fast charging capabilities, and so does a USB Type-C port. Elsewhere, you've also got a 3.5mm headphone jack, which can be handy for a set of speakers or indeed headphones. Speaking about audio, you have got two 5 watt speakers that are built in, which will suffice for basic music listening or indeed if you're taking a call. On that note, you have got a pop-up 5 megapixel camera with a built-in noise cancellation microphone and an LED indicator, so you can know when it's on operation and also very much useful for Windows Hello, making it an absolute breeze when you're signing into your computer. Now the monitor's capabilities don't just stop there, because you've got something called MultiView, which allows you to run two different streams simultaneously side by side, which can be handy in certain scenarios. Furthermore, you have got PIP and PBB modes, should you wish to use them. Now on that note, you've also got a built-in KVM switch. I won't go into great detail about it, because I've got a dedicated video of it, which can be found up on your pop-up banner or down in the description below, but while saying in a nutshell, it means that you can plug in your mouse and keyboard directly into the monitor and switch between different sources without having to unplug and replug your peripherals. So with that out of the way, let's talk about image quality. And here you have got a 40-inch curved IPS panel that has a matte coating to it. Now, 3D Monitors OST, you've got a dedicated sRGB and DCI-P3 color modes, which also have their brightness controls completely unlocked, which is certainly appreciated. Furthermore, you have got RGB user gains and also different color temperatures that you can select, for example, the native preset or the 6500 Kelvin mode. Now, via the sRGB mode, I had it tested via my calibrators with a gamut coverage of 95.1% and a gamut volume of 97%. Below, you can see how it compares to the sRGB color space. As for the average Dell TE, it sits at an impressive 1.09 with a maximum of just 1.93. Its tested contrast ratio came in at 1064 to 1 with a measured white point in comparison to the 6504 Kelvin target at 6045 Kelvin at 100%. As for its gamma curve, it sits pretty close to the 2.2 standard. Now, if you're not gonna be editing in the sRGB color space, or if you want a wider color gamut, you might want to select one of the other modes, specifically here, the DCI-P3 mode. And here, indeed, via the dedicated emulation mode, I was able to notice a positive impact in the gamut coverage and gamut volume, 
where it sat at 92.3% and 95.7% respectively. Below you can see how it compares to the DCI P3 color space, indeed not to be confused with what I just talked about before with the sRGB color space. Now here, in comparison to the DCI P3 modes, you can see that the average DLTE sits at just 1.03 and a maximum of 2.95. Indeed over here it can be used for serious image editing work even in the DCI P3 color space. Its tested contrast ratio does not change, however the measured white point does slightly shift at 6140 Kelvin at 100%, while the gamma curve does sit pretty close to the 2.6 standard which is required for said color space. Now moving past its colour performance I would like to have a quick word about its brightness and here it got up to 262 nits and it got all the way down to 61 nits. I didn't notice any sort of improvements in HDR and yes indeed this monitor has got an HDR signal that it can take. Now in terms of the overall brightness uniformity it is of course panel lottery but you can see how my Tesla panel performed across the board. Equally when it came to the backlight bleed which was noted at 100% brightness and in a completely pitch black room. Now moving past all these tests I would like to have a quick word about text clarity and here it's got an IPS panel which gives you good viewing angles. You've also got a 2500R curvature which gives you a little bit of extra immersion specifically on its ultra wide 21 by 9 aspect ratio and then you have got a whopping 5120 pixels by 2160 and at 39.7 inch in terms of its total form factor it gives you 140 ppi so yes indeed text looks very clear and sharp furthermore you've also got a bunch of eye certifications thanks to its low blue mode which you can enable through the monitor's osd and you've also got a flicker free panel so the monitor's competencies come in form of the overall image quality and also the inputs that one has however i just wanted to comment about its overall gaming performance and of course here it's not aimed at the gaming crowd, but I just thought to put it through its paces. Now here the input lag was tested objectively at 1 millisecond. And in terms of its response time, it very much depends as to which overdrive mode you select through the monitor's OSD. You've got off, fast, faster and fastest. Now via the OSRTD tool using the off mode preset, I had it objectively tested at 13.91 milliseconds. You can see this at the bottom left hand side of your screen. Going on the fast mode preset it went down to 12.1 milliseconds while on the faster mode preset which is the mode I would select it was tested at 8.37 milliseconds. However the fastest mode preset brings this down to 5.88 milliseconds but you'll be able to see towards the middle of your screen that you will incur a lot more RGB overshoot. And this does become very much apparent when you run the UFO ghosting test at 75 hertz as you'll be able to see a lot more inverse ghosting on its fastest mode preset. In other words, re-emphasizing the point that you should probably select the faster mode preset. Now to wrap up the gaming section, I would just like to point out it does have adaptive sync technologies. Although in my case I've got an RTX 3080 and when connected over DisplayPort, I was actually able to enable Nvidia G-Sync. However, while running the Nvidia Pendulum demo while G-Sync was successfully running, I did notice quite a bit of screen tearing, which seemed to indicate to me that actually G-Sync wasn't in operation. Nonetheless, I can only share my own experiences and therefore your experiences might differ from mine depending on your overall setup. Moving swiftly on, let's talk about its build quality. And here you've got a three side boardless design with a relatively thin bottom bezel. And therefore the ultra wide 40 inch monitor doesn't actually take up as much space on your desk as you might imagine. Now you've also got a small little sensor that's found within the center part of the bottom bezel. And this acts as the power and the light sensor effectively meaning that the monitor will try and save on power when you're away from your desk and also adjust its overall brightness level depending on your ambient light conditions. Of course you can enable or disable the behavior through the monitor's OSD. Now as for the stand it's actually very sturdy and quite heavy. It provides you height, swivel and tilt adjustments and this means that the monitor is actually quite ergonomic. Furthermore it's also very sturdy. But of course if you do not want to use the built-in stand you can replace it via Visa compatible stand. Now aside from that you have got a headphone stand that props out at the left hand side of the monitor. This can be quite handy if you have a set of headphones or earphones. Of course when not in use you can pop it back into the monitor giving you that sort of flush design. In order to access the monitor's OSC there are a set of physical buttons found at the bottom right hand side. Here you will also notice a dedicated mic mute button which can be handy in certain scenarios. 
Now the monitor settings are actually very comprehensively laid out and you've also got a plethora of options for you to play around with. Now should you not want to use the monitor's OSD, you can also use a software called Smart Control, which is free to download directly from Philips website. Indeed over here it allows you to control the monitor's settings via the use of software, which makes it actually quite intuitive to use on a day to day basis. So there we have it, hopefully you've enjoyed my detailed overview of this Philips ultrawide monitor. I'd be curious to know what you make of it down in the comment section below. Now if you've liked this video, definitely do consider dropping a like, subscribing and hitting that bell notification, all of which would be greatly appreciated. As such, I've been totally dubbed and I'll hopefully see you in the next one. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.